let's not waste any more time and dive right in by opening a blank touch designer file and clearing up the default patch. After that, I'm going to scroll up one level and have a look at modifying this master container that will form the bulk of our entire project. So for now, I'm going to call this control, uh, yes to all, and change its scale to be full screen. And I'm going to turn off borders and always on top. So now when I perform, I should have a perfectly blank window. Normally when I work, I work in a three by three split. I know I'm going to be using a lot of geometry and I tend to use the bottom right one as a scripting one if I should need it. So I've got my geometry for control in the top right. Obviously there's no geometry here yet. And then I've got text editor should I need it. So that first image we're going to add is we are going to bring in our alignment grid. So I'm going to drag that in. And this is massive. This is 8,100 by 8,100 pixels. So a perfect full dome image. It's got 10 degree increments going out and then 10 degree increments going around the side. There is also another version that's available to you that is transparent. And this is more useful for real world mapping. It has two degree increments and finer level of detail in the center that we'll come back to later on how and when you should use this. But for now, we'll use the big white one that is fully colored in. Okay, I'm gonna add this to a null and call it a reference. And then we are going to get, add this to a constant because we don't want it to be able to accept light. We're going to make a sphere. And then we're going to turn it into a polygon and make it as high frequency as our computer can handle. So when we're working on the SOP level, every time that a SOP is altered, it's hard on the CPU. So if we have a sphere that doesn't have any changes at all apart after the frequency, it means that all of the work will be done by the GPU, which is good. I'm then going to add a material. I'm also going to add a texture because we need to change the way that our image is being wrapped to the sphere. Because right now, if I wrap it, you'll see that we get this strange double hemisphere look, which we don't want because this is called an orthographic application. Uh, so the image starts to stretch the closer to the edge of the sphere it gets. So what we want to do is change our texture type to be fisheye. And this now means that this is perfectly mapping our image to the sphere on at least one half of it. On the other half, it's just garbage, but that is the half that we're going to disregard using the clip function. So I'm going to insert a clip. Uh, and you can see that it's clipped half the sphere, but the wrong half. So I am going to change this to be zero and then add that there. So I've changed the direction of what and in, in how we're cutting the sphere. You can see it's now got a nice clean border without those jagged edges that we had in the past. That's because we're just cutting the sphere on the right axis. So we have our sphere, it goes into our texture where we give it the fisheye coordinates and then we clip it so that we only see half of the sphere. Now, if I have a look at this, I'm pretty sure that that texture is backwards. So we want to operate our sphere from inside uh, as we would with a full dome. So we want the image to be stretched correctly inside here. So I have a few options. What I could do is I could flip my reference image, but that could get messy and it could come back to bite us later down the line. So what we want to do is actually play about with our texture positioning. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to invert the scale of the image. So I have told it to apply the texture using fisheye on the Z axis where we cut it. And then I've told it to invert the direction in which it applies it. So now you can see that the texture is a one-to-one -one match of what we want on the inside. Uh, you'll get used to navigating these in 3D. So every time I activate the SOP viewer, just using standard 3D application controls, left mouse being rotate, right mouse being pan, and middle mouse being dolly in and out. And this allows me to explore what I'm looking at without needing a proper 3D viewer yet. Because you can see in my geometry, there is no world space for our sphere. So now my texture is applied properly. 
you can see it reads correctly 180 degree full dome and that should say Michael McKellar program for people.com. Okay, so I've got my sphere, so I'm going to home that and I'm going to minimize it. Next thing I need to do is I need to make my 3D world. So I'm going to right click my outlet here from the SOP and I'm going to do geometry. And this will automatically replace the torus that comes by default in our geometry and it will map our 3D object through it. Perfect. So now we have a sphere in 3D space as well. Now, if I want to make any changes to my geometry, I would do it here inside this geo rather than into the SOP. Because as I'm saying, changing these blue ones is very CPU intensive. Changing uh, in the gray is, is uses GPU, it's nowhere near as intensive. So with our geometry created and set up, we may need to come back and make some geometry rotations here. So we have the access, right? I'm not sure how we need that set up, whether we want on the X, Y, or the Z, but we can now easily change that inside here without using any resources at all, because the GPU will crunch through a simple rotation of a sphere like this, no problem. So I'll set that back to zero. I'm going to mute that. So now we have a reference image coming in, which I can lock in place because we never need that to change. I've got to go into my constant so that the geometry here doesn't need light to illuminate it, which is important for projection mapping in this case, because we want the projector to show 100% accuracy on whatever it sees. And that's the next part we need to build now. So we have our geometry set up, but we need to add cameras that can then represent our projectors. So I'm going to add a basic camera system and I'll make this one our previewer. So our camera is five units away in Z space, but if we have a look at the render output, we can actually see that it's backwards, which tells me that it's outside of the sphere. If I was to move the pivot five points forward and then rotate it, you can see that we're actually on the wrong side of the sphere. So the first thing we're gonna do is, I'm not gonna adjust that in terms of the preview camera, I'm actually gonna rotate our entire geometry because if our one camera starts here, it means anytime users add new cameras, they're also gonna start here. So we need them to be on the right side by default. So I want to rotate it by 180 degrees on the, this is the Y axis. And now the camera, if we look in our 3D geometry viewer is five units away from our sphere. We also have the interesting concept of this sphere that we've made has a radius of one by one by one. In this case, all our units will be one meter, but we don't address whether users should be able to change the size of the sphere. So what happens if you have a 20 meter dome by 20 meters or a 25 by 20, uh, if your dome isn't as deep, all of them can be compensated for inside of this dome viewer. For now, we'll leave this sphere with a one meter radius and then we'll decide what to do about it further down the development pipeline when we come to allowing the users more finer control over their projector positioning. So that I remember this, I'm actually going to add it to our project plan, but I'm going to update it in such a way that I know it's a new addition. And anything I add, I'm going to give the color orange and say user control for dome settings size, radius, position, etc. And I'm going to plug that in over here and just give it a little dotted line back over here. So I know that this is a new addition that we need to consider. Let's put it outside just so we know that it's a new addition. So it's a small thing, but it could make a difference. Whereas if you have a non equidistant dome, it will make a big difference on what things do and don't see. Before we continue with any development, I'm going to make sure that we properly set up our project and save location for this. So I'm going to file save as, and then I have a special location, obviously for where I record, save all my recordings. So I've got series, field on mapping, and then I'm going to make new folder project spelled correctly. project spelled correctly. And then here I'm going to make a new save for my main underscore program. 
The reason I'm going to make a folder for each of my individual assets that come into this in the forms of toes or toxes is that I want to make sure that I have a good version control history that Touch Designer thankfully does for us by numerically increasing every save. But I also want to make sure that I don't have a massive amount of information in each in a, a main root folder here. So I want to know that if I want the main project, I go into main project. If I want the projection controller, I'll go into the projection controller folder when we make it. So main program, I'm going to call it main underscore program underscore one. Save. And now it'll be saved. If I do command S again, it will increment the number. So I now have a version that I've named and it will increment the number to be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 until I'm happy or I need to increase the number myself.